My name is Anton Lavrik, and my talk today is about scaling Erlang developer experience at WhatsApp. A few words about myself. Um, I've been an enthusiastic user of Erlang since 2007, and I've been using Erlang for building various server applications. It's been seven years since I joined WhatsApp, and more recently, I've been leading WhatsApp Erlang team. Our team's mission is to improve Erlang to make developers more productive. And this is largely the topic of my talk today. When somebody opens WhatsApp, sends and receives messages, participates in group chats, all of these interactions are handled by a large server system written in Erlang. And this works extremely well. One of WhatsApp founders said that choosing Erlang was the best engineering decision we ever made. This was six years ago. I believe this still holds true in 2020, but our situation has changed dramatically over the years. We have many more engineers, much larger code base, much bigger product, and we're now a part of Facebook, a very large tech company. In this talk, I'm gonna start with highlighting things that have worked really well with Erlang. Then I'll describe challenges of us growing into a much larger engineering team. And finally, I'll go over some of the main Erlang limitations and steps we're taking to address them. I'll talk about static typing, namespaces, and various tools. If I were to highlight what works so well with Erlang, it comes down to two things. The first one is extremely efficient architecture that Erlang can beam enable. Here's a simple intuition. If you were to write WhatsApp server using a different language, you would design it differently. For our domain, which is scalable network services, we see systems being written in C++, Java, and more recently in Rust and Go. In our experience, Erlang's lightweight processes, message passing, distribution, and share nothing memory model offer massive advantages over other stacks. The second thing that works so well with Erlang is extremely efficient developer cycle for smaller teams. During early years of WhatsApp, this allowed us to scale the service to almost a billion of users with only 25 server engineers. Back then, our change test deploy cycle was amazingly short. The closest analogy is perhaps doing web development and hitting page refresh to pick up a modified version. But unlike with PHP or Python, we were able to do this for stateful services, databases, and thousand machine clusters. This probably fully applies to Elixir as well, but try achieving this in a non-Beam language. This would require massive upfront investment in infrastructure. This is one of the differences we see between the WhatsApp scaling model and Facebook scaling model, for example. Facebook is predominantly written in C++ on the infrastructure side, and they took a completely different path. So how are we adjusting to a new reality of being a much larger and rapidly growing Erlang team? Key observation is that Things that didn't matter at smaller scale began to matter. When we were a smaller team, a lot of conventions and tools were absorbed by following examples in the current system. We never got to argue about things like tabs versus spaces, choice of a build tool, or how individual team members chose to write their tests. Typically, we'd go with the simplest possible solutions. So how to provide fast development cycle with many more engineers? Not only this makes organization more efficient, but we as engineers tend to be happier when things work fast. The immediate effect of not addressing tools and conventions while adding more people is that everybody becomes less efficient, but maybe it's okay and some inefficiencies cannot be avoided. Turns out the answer to this question depends on the scale. What we learned from Facebook experience is that developer productivity for large teams become critical, not merely important. Everything that helps shorten the developer cycle matters. A simple example of it is catching a problem at compile time is 
much cheaper than catching it in CI, let alone in production. This is the reason why Facebook has been heavily investing in this over the years. And in many areas, it offers fantastic developer experience at unprecedented scale. For example, Facebook has a language called Hack. It is a statically typed dialect of PHP. Hack has a tight integration with ID, which allows to show type checker errors interactively as you type. Let me show you an example of what it looks like. Here we have a type mismatch error between a string and an integer. You can see a red squiggly line highlighting it on line 14. But then there are also yellow squigglies on line 3 and 12 pointing to places where the error is likely to come from. And of course, many more things become possible with types when they're tightly integrated with IDE. This includes, for example, type aware completions, quick fixes, refactorings, many other things. So does Erlang developer experience scale to larger teams? What would this translate to in terms of modern software engineering practices? There are two key things about this. First, as I mentioned earlier, this become critical for larger teams, but this can be very handy even for smaller teams. Second, when we were discussing our work with Robert Verding, Erlang co-author, he pointed out that these were not the requirements uh, when Erlang was originally designed in the 90s. And I think that applies to uh, some other things that we see in Erlang ecosystem, including OTP and some of the tools in the OTP and beyond. What does it mean in practical terms? One thing, uh, one way to think about it is by comparing Erlang with modern languages that were designed with latest requirements in mind. Go, TypeScript, Kotlin are really good examples here. What makes them different is that they come with tightly integrated and often co-designed tooling. A good example of this is again, static typing. Showing type errors interactively in IDE has a profound effect on developer experience. But does it make type checker and IDE tools? Or maybe they should be considered a part of the language or language experience. Another relevant example here is Erlang Shell, which is familiar to most Erlangers. For those of us who use it, it becomes an integral part of the language experience. Let's look at some major trends we see in the industry for modern languages or for languages in general. The first trend is a shift to modern languages with well-integrated tooling, as I mentioned earlier. When Erlang was created, it was competing mainly with C++ and Java. These days, and especially in the future, Erlang is going to be competing with languages like Go and Rust. We also see a strong industry trend of introducing static typing for dynamically typed languages. And this trend is driven by the same goals we have for scaling our Erlang teams. And here's a question. What would it take to evolve Erlang into a modern language with integrated tooling and static typing? We see examples of this being done for other languages like Hack and TypeScript. Can we follow the same path with Erlang? Now let's break it down and talk about individual components of modern developer experience, starting with static typing. I'm very happy to announce that we've been working on static typing for Erlang. There is a popular misconception that static typing either adds boilerplate or somehow gets in the way of doing what a developer wants to do. Based on experience of adding static typing to other high level languages, we know this is not true. TypeScript and Hack are really good examples here. Our goal is to prove that with static typing, Erlang engineers can be much more productive for teams of any sizes. We're going, we're going to be open sourcing an early prototype later this year, and we'll be sharing more details then. In the meantime, I'd like to talk about several high level things about our approach. The first one is targeting usability and particularly usability for interactive workflows. 
It means fast type checker, good error messages, showing squiggly lines in IDE on errors, and also offering simple workflow. Um, let's look at a very good example of an error message from Elm. Elm is often praised by having the best error messages. Here you can see a human readable description, uh, squigglies pointing to the line where the problem and the code where the problem occurs, and also extra context that allows you to quickly fix it. The second key aspect about static typing is giving you a reliable signal. The signal you can trust. If the type checker doesn't return errors, it means you're go not gonna get them at runtime. Another aspect is that the type checker treats specs as contracts. contracts. For example, dialyzer doesn't work this way, which sometimes lead to a very non-intuitive behavior. Also, a type checker reminds you when you forget to handle certain patterns and case expressions. Let's take a look at another example from Elm. Here you can see it printing an error on a missing empty list pattern. And uh, as in the previous example, uh, there is a very clear human readable and comprehensible message and an extra context. This is the type of experience we are targeting with our work. You may be wondering why guarantees matter so much. Here are a couple of motivating examples. Imagine you're a new team member who approaches a large 10 year old system and the code base. How do you know that your relatively small incremental change is safe and it's not going to break something in a different part of the code? Now imagine you're an experienced old timer who wants to do a refactor on a core piece of logic but you no longer have a clear mental model to do this reliably because there were 20 other people who contributed to this part of the code in the previous month alone. One may argue that good tests could help in these situations, and they do, but they have limits. First, it takes longer to get signal from tests compared to a type checker. Second, when refactoring, you'd need to refactor the tests as well. And you may not be able to rely on them working correctly while you're refactoring them. There is a lot of low level over, uh, there is a lot of overhead involved in maintaining low level tests and things like defensive guards that won't be needed with good static typing. For Erlang users, one way to imagine what a good static typing solution would look like is by thinking of it as better dialyzer. For those who use dialyzer, imagine the best experience you can get with a tool like that. We're talking about a tool that gives you great error messages, catches more errors, and doesn't create friction. Here's an example of how static typing can help with promoting API consistency and good API practices. This is a simple example showing variability of conventions in existing airline code bases. Wouldn't it be better to pick only one way of modeling optional values? This is where a new construct we call enum together with static typing could help. In this example, they play a role of modeling a common abstraction and also enforcing it, it at compile time. The enum that you see here is a new nominal data type we're introducing in the language. It is commonly referred to as discriminated union and it directly corresponds to similar constructs in some other languages such as Rust, OCaml, and Haskell. Here's another example. Opaque types is a great idea but how to guarantee that the representation doesn't leak? And how can you reliably abstract something by turning it opaque? Again, this is something that a well thought out static typing model and implementation can help with.
Another really good example on the intersection of static typing and robustness is GenServer. GenServer is the most common building block for concurrent Erlang applications. It is a very powerful and useful abstraction. However, it has problems. First, in order to tell what the API is, one has to read the implementation. And then there is no guarantees that it doesn't change in a breaking manner, especially when calling GenServer from another machine. This is both inefficient and error prone. We are working on some on prototyping a declarative API for GenServer and hope to share more details later this year. Let's talk about namespaces. As you all know, Erlang module and record namespaces are flat. Here is an example showing a problem with this. At WhatsApp, we use an RPC framework called Thrift. We use it for connecting to hundreds of other services across Facebook. For those who haven't heard of Thrift, it's a very similar to more widely known protocol buffers and gRPC. There is an ideal language and it has namespaces. And so do most other languages used in the industry these days. But Erlang doesn't have namespaces. And when trying to map Thrift namespaces to Erlang, we get very long module and record names. These are, there are ways to manually override less ergonomic long names and assign shorter ones. But this doesn't really solve the problem if you have hundreds of Thrift files and hundreds of engineers. At scale, it is impossible to guarantee that engineers come up with consistent short names every time they get to use Thrift. Um, interoperability with other languages like Thrift in the above example is one of the uh, reason why namespaces are badly needed. Namespaces can also help structure larger code bases. This is why they were introduced in other languages in the first place. And of course, they are a very useful tool when it comes to building a larger and healthy open source library ecosystem. Now let's talk about tools. At WhatsApp, we're currently using Rebar 3, and it's also a de facto community standard. It's gotten a lot better lately, thanks to contributions from the community, our colleagues at WhatsApp, and a lot of work from the maintainers. For example, problems with build correctness were addressed, and it now supports parallel builds running much faster. But the important thing to realize about Rebar 3 is that it was not designed to be used for larger projects and modern development experience workflows. Um, if I were to reframe them in terms of requirements for build system, there will be two sources of re such requirements. The first one is scale, which comes down to having a large code base, large monorepos, and programs written in different languages and being dependent on each other. The second one is developer, the developer experience workflows I was talking about earlier. This comes down to support of static typing and being able to drive the build very fast to enable interactive workflows. We have been discussing various solutions internally, but there's nothing concrete yet. One observation here is that these two sides of requirements may require two different solutions. I'm very happy to say that we've been working on Erlang for Matter for some time and it's now ready for wider adoption. It's a really good one and they think you'll like it. The idea behind auto for matters is that you and your colleagues don't have to style your code manually and don't have to waste time arguing about styling conventions. The tool does it for you. These days formatters are available for almost all languages and overwhelming sentiment from developers using them is that they wouldn't go back to styling their code manually. If you're an Erlang user and you haven't tried Erlang LS yet, you're missing out. Erlang LS is a relatively new project, but it already offers a really good Erlang support. The idea of a language server is that you can use it from any editor. For example, VS Code or Emacs. 
At Facebook, we use VS Code for our ID environment, and we're currently rolling out Erlang support for it using Erlang LS. Roberta Loy, a leader of Erlang LS, is giving a talk about it tomorrow afternoon. So please consider attending if you're interested in that space. There are more exciting projects at WhatsApp targeting developer experience. One of the biggest one is providing an ergonomic and scalable way to test Erlang code. Think of it as running tests without leaving your ID and getting very fast response times. Another exciting one is being able to run all WhatsApp services in a single Beam instance. To me, this really highlights the power of Beam. I don't think it is possible to run and test a large distributed application this way in any other language stack. We're hoping to talk more about these projects at future conferences, so stay tuned for more talks. In conclusion, I would like to go back to my question. Does our Lang developer experience scale for larger teams and code bases? We believe the answer is yes. Furthermore, I'm sure that a lot of things I mentioned in my talk would be useful for other Erlang developers and teams, small and large. I'm very excited to be here, share our thinking and some details about our projects at WhatsApp. And I look forward to what comes next to, for Erlang. This is all I had for today, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. This is awesome, Anton. Thank you very, very much. I mean, wow. Um, such a compelling rationale for, for taking Erlang to the next level. And uh, yeah, this is really something that's really, really exciting. Thank you for, for sharing. And let's, let's open up for, for q and I'm sure there will be uh, a number of, of curious questions. Let's see what we have in the Hula app here. Uh, let's see here now. Um, this is from Fred Herbert. Um, are there plans for improvement aiming to integrate with more community work or to be parallel and uh, Facebook owned long term? Um, uh, this is an excellent question. In general, the way we see ourselves uh, positioning in the community has been an integral part of it. Um, so what I've been sharing in my talk is uh, very early, um, uh, is just the beginning, right? And uh, what we've been doing for the past, uh, over the past six months is uh, connecting to various um, uh, players in, in the community and members in the community. And we're connected with the OTP team, uh, Elixir core team, um, ESL, uh, Erlang Solutions, uh, Happy Hacking, Quivic, and uh, many others. We're also participating in EEF and uh, look forward to increase uh, uh, our participation. And uh, generally, with especially with open sourcing, uh, we're hoping to engage much more on the community front. Uh, once we are ready to to open source something and start the a wider conversation around some of the work that we do, but a lot of initiatives at WhatsApp, as uh, many of you know, they're already uh, visible uh, um, in in the community. So, uh, well, one of examples is, as I said, participation in EF working groups, contributions to Rebar, contributions to OTP. Um, uh, and uh, more recently, our collaboration with Airline PLS and uh, open sourcing of uh, Airline Formatter. Thank you. Um, checking the Whova app and the questions here. We have one. It's not a question. It's a it's a comment uh, with a with a lot of votes on it uh, from from Kenneth Ludin saying just a very good talk. Um, uh, here we have Thank a question. Um, it's from uh, Danilis Petrovs. Will the new build tool project cover multi-language projects like Airline plus Elixir plus other Beam languages? Uh, this is 
Yeah, this is a very good question. I think the honest answer is that we don't know. Um, uh, we don't use Elixir at WhatsApp. And uh, from our experience of being at Facebook, we know that integrating two languages or several languages with each other and connecting them is, is a very difficult, right? So that's, uh, that, that's quite a constraint if we were to decide to do that. But on the other hand, Elixir is a fantastic language, right? And, the, and a big part of this Beam uh, community and the Erlang ecosystem. And we, we definitely discussed this topic, not in the context of build system, but bringing two languages closer to each other. Let's say if we were to introduce namespaces, would they be compatible with the Elixir model? Or if we were to, uh, once we uh, have a, a static model uh, and static typing implementation in place, would it be something that Elixir could reuse in some in some shape or form? Um, so these are the conversation that we're uh, having with uh, other community members, and I think they're it's well worth having them. Okay, here's another question from Morten Nilsson. Uh, which is, in your opinion, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of improving the developer experience for, for your airline developers? Um, if you're referring to challenges that we have today, oh, lower hanging fruit. All right, so let me take a step back. I think a lot of these problems are just inherently hard. And if you look at uh, how these problems are addressed for other languages, usually there are lots and lots of resources put behind them. Uh, and lang languages are expensive. So Erlang was developed over many years, uh, same with Elixir. And uh, we think of it as more of a strategic path uh, of investing in that space. Talking about more tactically, um, I would probably mention three. Um, ID integration uh, for matter, they're essentially there, right? Everybody can benefit from Erlang TLS and uh, Erl format, which is one of the few, right? That, uh, that that's, that's a good option to have, a good place to be with a few different alternatives. And also testing. I think testing is a, is a big, um, um, big, very big projects and very exciting project that we're, uh, my, our colleagues at WhatsApp are working on. And we, we should see massive improvements from their work. It's just being able to do this more ergonomically and faster, that, that, that's, a, that's a very big deal. And static typing, it's a very big project, so I wouldn't call it a low hanging fruit. It's going to take a while. Okay, let's see what do we have here. We have another question. Did you evaluate Hamler and consider joining that project? Right, so for those who don't know, Hamler is a, a statically typed language on the beam. Uh, one of a, a, a recent uh, batch of languages um, that includes pure Erl and uh, Glean. And um, we definitely have looked at all of them. And uh, the main difference is, is uh, being able to adopt it at, at, uh, for larger teams and existing mature code bases. Uh, none of these projects have this constraint and this requirement. And that makes our work different, right? So we're staying in Erlang, trying to bend it and evolve it and extend it in such a way that we can adopt it for existing systems. Um, there is a, in theory, it is possible to use two languages side by side if they're running on the same runtime, like Java and Scala, for example. But this is, very complicated at scale. 
at our scale, it would mean that we would have to do a lot of things twice and engineers would have to train, hundreds of engineers would have to learn and, and train and understand be proficient in, in both languages. And then the boundary between them is, uh, is also crossing the boundary is painful. Like there's a lot of me mental overhead trying to decide which language you should use for this or that. And it's rarely when you can get a, a, a no mismatch when crossing the boundary between two languages unless they were specifically designed for that. Um, a good example of that perhaps is Erlang Elixir. So we know that the Elixir is ahead of uh, Erlang in terms of tooling and ergonomics in some areas. Well, it's been this way for some time. I don't know if, if the balance is going to shift or not. Um, but uh, using both languages at the same time is 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 not like some like it's usually Elixir calling into Erlang, but not the other way around. So it's it's a complicated problem, um, and we decided not to go down that path. Uh, 